Hey guys, thanks for joining me for this 31st episode in Season 2 of Good Questions with Cameron Dole. Special guests for this episode include podcaster Robert Williams. We'll talk about his podcast, UNAS Midwatch, in which he plays the role as Chief Master Gunny Doom. We'll also visit with beekeeper Ted McFall. We'll talk about the new Murder Hornets documentary that's available now. We'll also visit with singer and songwriter Jen Bostic. The single, Jealous of the Angels, we'll be talking about today. Of course, if you would, please take the time to subscribe, drop a like, comment, leave some feedback, and of course, share with your friends. Well, considering the weather that we've been through so far this year, I mean, any temperature over 5 degrees probably feels tropical, am I right? Well, a new survey asked people to name the lowest temperature that they believe is warm enough to wear shorts outside. Now, the most common answer was between 61 and 70, which got 25% of the vote. Between 71 and 80 came in second with 23% of the vote. But there are definitely people who go more extreme in both directions. Now, 8% of people say 41 to 50 is shorts weather. 6% say they'll wash shorts when it's between 31 and 40. And there's even 4% of people who said they'll wear shorts outside when it's below 20. Now, on the other end of the scale, 7% of people don't think shorts weather starts until it's over 80. And men are more likely to wear shorts in those colder temperatures, and women much more likely to hold out until it's a lot warmer outside. Well, our first guest is Robert Williams, a podcaster in his own right, has the UNAS Midwatch. Uh, Robert Williams, uh, you may know him better as Chief Master Gunny Doom. And first off, uh, I don't know whether to call you Gunny, Doom, Chief Master, or uh, <laughs> what to call you, but <laughs> Robert, thank you for taking the time to, to be on the show today. Hey, man, thanks for having me on. It's, uh, it's an honor to be on your podcast, so let's do this thing. I know it's uh, it's been a crazy week. We've had some some great guests, and uh, for you, podcasting. Where did I, I know when we first reached out and first talked? You said uh, that somebody said about six years ago, uh, get, kind of urged you to to, to podcast. Why, why and uh, and how has it been so far, if you will? So about six or eight years ago, I'm not too sure on the timeline. It was just like a, a running gag for a bit. Um, I was standing watch and on the ship and I was, I'm in the Navy. Um, it was a late night watch and I've always felt like the late night watches, they always kind of had like this, I don't know, mysticism around them that you just come up and you have these crazy conversations and there's no, you couldn't even like track how these conversations link together. And <clears throat> I would, I was on watch and I started to get it up almost like a following. They join me up on watch, even if they were supposed to be in bed and we just start having conversations. And one of my closest friends, um, we'll call her Clausel is her last name. I don't know if she wants me to say her name, but Madeline, <laughs> if, if you're there, I'm sorry. <laughs> um, she said, you, you need to have a podcast. And I said, what is a podcast? <laughs> me too. <laughs> <laughs> so a few years go by, I, thought of the midwatch idea of just military members getting together and telling crazy stories. And then I started looking into podcasts and finding out about podcasts. And I fell upon one of my favorite podcasts and still is to this day. And they had this format that I really, really liked. So I was like, okay, I could stick with this format. And then I just kind of rambled around in my head for a little bit and started looking at other military podcasts. And it's just, people sitting around kind of doing the same thing I was thinking. I was like, well, there's my idea. It's gone. It's already used. <laughs> so I thought, why not have something that's different? Something someone who's not in the military might be able to latch onto uh, how we all join this new military. And we have no idea what we're doing because it's a brand new military and nobody's done this before. So I was hoping that the listeners could follow along and sort of learn our military with us. And then I, a couple of friends were like, that is a great idea. So we started brainstorming and came up and there you have it. UNAS Midwatch. Now, now, now where did uh, UNAS Midwatch, where'd you come up with the name in the first place? <laughs> so you know, I knew you know I was what <laughs> I knew I wanted to incorporate all of the branches of service because they all are necessary. And, but I needed something that just, I don't know, sounded 
ridiculous. And I was just like, let me take something from each branch of what they do. And you got nautical, which is Navy, um, air, air force right. soldier. And that encompasses a whole bunch. Um, and just kind of jammed them all together and started trying to find an acronym that worked. And uh, one of my main, main, main side characters that I do, I was just, um, sitting there one day and I was, I was like, huh, unass, <laughs> unass. That doesn't sound right, but I like it. And I said, just you nass that, that works. Now, so that what, was it. what, what has been the hardest part getting, uh, getting going in the podcast world and what's, what's maybe the biggest, uh, tidbit that you've learned. Oh man, so much. Um, getting started is the hardest part. Um, getting over the hurdle that your idea, you know, the imposter syndrome, so to speak, you know, your idea sucks, get over that hurdle and just start. <laughs> um, then of course, uh, editing, editing is one of the hardest things to learn. Cause if you don't know what you're doing, you don't know what you're doing. Um, <laughs> I remember my first three episodes, we, when we came out, I was the one just trying to learn how to edit while I'm editing. And I wasn't good. I wasn't good at all. And then you think you got this great product and you launch it and then you hear it back on the, whatever you're listening through. And you're like, wow, this is awful. <laughs> <laughs> so, and then, you know, it took me to about episode three where I really kind of started getting a groove in how I edit and started learning more. And then by episode five, I'm putting in like background noise. So we're not, you know, on this made up tank aircraft ship, in a vacuum and we can't hear anything outside of us. So it was a lot to learn. The the marketing I think has been the hardest thing for me to learn is uh, and the, 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 I think the biggest key that the, the, the biggest eye opening moment for me was the hashtag. Whenever somebody said, uh, start hashtagging. And then you, I started hashtagging and immediately saw numbers start ticking up. I'm like, well, wait a second. There, there, there may be something to this. Yeah. Hashtags and ads for whatever medium you're on is it's crucial. If you want your thing out there, not your podcast, your, your name out there, you have to throw those in. And I'm still learning. I always forget to put them in there. Everything that I launch. Um, I'm big on memes. I figure with a comedy podcast, you need memes. So once a week, twice a week, I'm launching a meme, but I always, always forget to put that freaking hashtag in there. <laughs> all funny get well, now what's the hashtag you guys have come up with uh well we do um mostly comedy veterans military um podcasting that's a big one um just mixing it up different trying different things now it, being military and, and doing a a comedy military <laughs> podcast i mean how hard is that to uh to keep things straight because i know i I'm a military brat myself, so I, I understand there's there's things you do and things you don't do. And uh, how careful do you really have to be in uh, in your recording? So I was really extremely worried about that when I first started this. And to be honest, um, that's why I wanted to go the alternate universe, alternate president, alternate command, alternate everything. So I didn't have to be as careful. And if I have this alternate reality, where none of the militaries exist except this one, I can pick and choose what stories I can play with in real life and just twist them a little bit to make it more almost real time. And, and I guess you're probably lucky that, uh, that, that Kanye didn't win, right? <laughs> right. <laughs> that would have thrown a wrench into things. It would have, but I would have come up with something else ridiculous. Now, what is what's been the, uh, the 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 most bizarre moment that you guys have had so far on the podcast? I think when we clicked, because when you start podcasting, you don't realize how hard it is to be in front of a mic and talk. You know, when you as you you know you're right in front of a mic right now, but when you're four people sitting around a table. We have that notion where we want to look and talk to people like that, but having to talk into a mic and not worry about actually looking at the person. And I think that was around episode three when we really kind of hit the groove with that. And if you, if you listen and pay attention, I think you can tell in all of us that we just kind of flow after that. 
Now for, for you, the, uh, the, the improv side of it, uh, is, is that easy for you or is that more like where you get in your comfort zone and you just kind of get out of, uh, out of Robert's skin, if you will? So the improv part of it, and I really, I wanted to emphasize that when we actually do come up on watch and you could be around four people you've never met before on an actual mid watch. So improv is just part of standing an actual watch when it, when you are in the military. Right. And so I wanted to make sure, like, I didn't want to script anything. And I thought it would lose its kind of flair, if you will, um, of the purpose of why we're doing this. If we went for a script, but the improv part, sometimes it, it can get out of hand and I'm <laughs> glad we have editing. Um, but uh, yeah, I just, it's a little hard, but it actually comes kind of natural for a lot of military members because we have to meet people we don't know. We have to start stories we don't know or start stories with people we don't know. So I think it was just natural for us to do an improv instead of script. Now you talked about editing being the, uh, the, the, the biggest challenge early on. How, how has editing time changed now as opposed to episode one? Oh, what, what took me a couple, four or five days, I've been able to get down to about, I can do it in a day so we could record and I could edit and have it out for review to the guys in about a day now. Now what's, what's the, the, the big thing, whenever you're editing, what's the, what's the thing that jumps out for you? What's the biggest thing you got to make sure, yeah, we're not going to have that in it, it. It's not the breaths or anything like that. What's, what's the biggest thing you're trying to cut out? Uh, just making sure we're, um, we don't sound stupid. <laughs> I want that level of uh, kind of moronic level that we all kind of like to hit because we're all just trying to have fun. And it's just now that we've introduced all the characters for us, we're, we're comfortable with each other. So you're comfortable with each other and then we slip off the rails. So if there's a bit that doesn't work for the podcast, or we talk over each other too much. That, that's the one that really gets me is losing an entire bit because we laugh too loud or we talk over each other and you kind of miss the joke. Now, who is, uh, are, are you the, uh, you the production uh, supervisor on the podcast? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> um, I actually got started into writing movie scripts a couple of years ago. And um, this was all really, my idea and don't get me wrong the other guys have given me a lot of ideas and we use a lot of everybody's ideas so it's it started out as me but has slowly become everybody everybody has inputs and i wouldn't take that away from those guys they input as much as i do now now what uh, as you look at stats and everything I, I don't know if you're like me i i love looking at stats and and seeing where the bizarre people or not the bizarre people but the bizarre places that have picked up the podcast where's where's the place that uh, when you saw it you're like i'm huge in so and so um so we've had a couple in great britain um new zealand australia um i think there was there's a couple in Europe that were like, I don't even know anybody in Europe. <laughs> um, then again, I have so many friends on Facebook and former military friends that, you know, they get transferred all over the world. I'm often wondering, are those, those guys awesome. Now, now for you, is this something that you look to, uh, to, to maybe be a full-time gig once the, once the military is behind you, if you will? Well, military's only got about six more months of my life left. So um, I don't know. Um, I have, I've, everybody has high hopes for anybody that says they don't get into podcasting. So I just want to be the guy in the background. I just want to be underground podcaster for the rest of my, no, you don't. Everybody wants to be famous. Everybody wants to get paid for it. Um, could it be a, a job? Maybe. I don't think so. Um, right now it's just a hobby and, I don't know if I see it going past the hobby. Now, if I'm getting paid, of course, I'm going to give it more money and more time of my life. But right now, it's just a fun, fun hobby that I like doing. Now, if if somebody out there is a is been thinking about the podcasting, what you talk about uh, the investment? What what kind of investment were you talking? I'm sorry. Say again. 
what kind of investment for you to to start up the podcast? You know, whether it's recording equipment, uh, things like that. Oh um, well, I would love to improve our recording equipment. We got um, a cheap set off of um, the internet when we first started, just and we had no idea what we were doing. One guy actually had a mic because his girlfriend uh, likes to sing, but that was it. That was the only thing we had. No um, mixer. We had no splitter. Uh, we, all our sound is post in post-production. So I'd like to get something that puts the sound live so we can react live instead of having to go, Oh, what was that? And then I have to go back in later and put it in. Um, so yeah, live sound would be nice. Better mics, of course, maybe a, a room dedicated for us to record the podcast I don't want to go video route because I feel that it's a very audio medium for us. I think if we're pretending to be on a tank aircraft ship, the quarter deck and standing watch late at night, I think it would take away from it. So right. just upping our audio game would be great. The, the, the different segments and genres of, of, of podcast. I mean, was there, was there ever any thought of doing something a little different or was this always uh, the way you saw it going? Yes. Um, I had talked with my um, co-hosters and some wanted to go a little bit more serious route. Um, some wanted just um, just to have us sitting around talking. Um, I didn't think it was niche enough. I thought it was too broad. And everything I've heard, you want to hit your niche audience first and get as much as your niche audience because that's your true listeners. Right. And I just kind of wanted something that we could start with our niche audience and then bring in more people later. Once they find out, Oh, this is, they have like a sci-fi thing going on and it's a little different, but I, I just didn't want to be the same and get kind of lost in the, the group of other podcasters doing the same thing we wanted to do. Now, have you reached out to Kanye's people to have the president doing any uh, announcements <laughs> or anything? Yeah, he keeps ducking me. Keeps ducking me. <laughs> he does that. He does that. Yeah. Now, what uh, the, the the coming episodes? Uh, how does how's the storyline uh, unfolding? <laughs> so, um, like I said, it's a it's a tank, aircraft, and ship all rolled into one. Eventually, it's going to be a spaceship when Space Force gets off their butts. Um, <laughs> but. Um, Right now we're doing what I'm calling ground trials and we're driving across. I think we're in the Midwest right now on this huge tank ship thing. And um, we're just kind of going through um, the motions really. But um, we have wristwatches that are connected to an artificial intelligence on board. And I am in charge of the artificial intelligence, but it's getting a little too smart for us. (laughs) <laughs> but we found a way to take off the wristwatches and now she's mad at me. Of course. Of course. And uh, now how close are, are you to, to the chief master Gunny doom? I mean, how close are you uh, personally to, to that character? Uh, well, um, I, I say in the podcast that chief master Gunny doom has 17 kids and I got five. Um, the 17 thing was a pure accident. Um, I don't know where it came from when they asked me, I just blurted it out and we just stuck with it. Um, it's been a running gag the rest of the time. Uh, I do have a lot of kids. Five is quite a bit, but not 17, not a Duggar. Um, so as for what it is, it's, it's not me totally. There's bits and parts. It's hard to do a main character and not have bits and parts of you. So there are some parts of me, but then there's other parts that I just take and I dial up to 10 and that's chief master going to do. Now, now if folks want to, to find more information about uh, UNAS Midwatch, where's, uh, where's the best place not only to find the podcast, but uh, all the socials as well. So we don't have much of a um, website yet, but we do have our Facebook group, um, at the, uh, at UNAS Midwatch podcast on Facebook, Instagram, and then on Twitter, it's at UNAS Midwatch. Apparently it's, that's as long as you can go with uh, Twitter, <laughs> yeah. but, um, Careful. yeah. Uh, but that's our three main ones right now. Um, uh, we kind of just started up the Twitter. We're all old people, so we didn't social media much. 
And I'm finding that's a lot of time consuming also. Very much so. You know, I, that's one of the things in my previous job, whenever Twitter first came out, I, I got onto Twitter. So I was, I was early into it. I, I know what I'm doing. I'm just not real good at posting. Yeah, it is. It's a, it's a change of pace to go from not doing it at all. Cause I was, I had the Facebook, but that's all I had. And then I couldn't figure out whether I do a page or a group. So I made both. And then I got on Instagram just to get the podcast out there. And I had to have my daughters show me how to do that. <laughs> um, but Twitter, Twitter's just there, <laughs> to be honest. <laughs> well, that's good stuff. Now, now, Robert, uh, again, UNAS Midwatch, uh, anywhere you pick up podcasts. And then uh, you said Twitter, Instagram, and uh, Facebook, and a group as well on Facebook. Yes. Okay. Um, we're on everything. All the way from Google to Podbean to Podbelly, we're everywhere. If you I'd can figure it out, out, it's a it's a very small group, um, mainly internet provider. Mm -hmm. um, so you have to be connected, and I don't think they have an app. But I requested to join, and they let me join. So I was like, heck yeah, more people, member of the club right <laughs> well robert it's been uh, great to visit with you today i i wish you best of success with uh, the podcast i know you have your ups and downs uh, keep going that's the, the i think that's the biggest uh, the yeah. biggest key right yeah um we i told everybody we're not in this for a short haul this is a long haul process we are just random people so we're not going to get famous overnight and we don't have much of a following so Luckily, between the four of us, we had a lot of friends on Facebook, so we got a good jump on things right away. Well, that's good. And uh, Robert, continued success to you, man. And uh, thanks so much for, for being a part of the show today. Oh, I appreciate it. Thanks for having me on. Thanks again to our friends at Smiley's Breezy Vapes, 313 Falcon Road here in Altus. They've got great red basket specials all the time. They've got new hardware selections and, of course, the largest selection of disposable flavors in southwest Oklahoma. Smiley's Breezy Vapes. Give them a call or send a text at 580-471-VAPE. Well, can you name a sound that you used to hear a lot before the pandemic, but not anymore? Well, a new survey asked people to name the top sounds that they've missed during COVID, and live music got the most votes. Like I said, live music, 38%, said it's one of the top sounds they miss. Number two, surround sound at movie theaters, 35%. Number three, hearing a huge crowd cheering in person, 28%. And number four, the sound of our kids or grandkids playing nearby, 24%. And of course, isn't that also a sound parents would love to stop hearing right now? Eh, one day would be great, right? Anyway, other sounds that people said that they miss include sermons in church, slot machines, and hearing someone say, I love you in person. Well, we're also looking forward to having face-to-face -face conversations without masks on. Now, three out of four people think it's more difficult to have real conversation with masks. 57% say it's a lot harder to have a good chat on Zoom than it is in person. And six in 10 agree the pandemic has hurt our conversation skills in general. Well, our next guest is beekeeper Ted McFall. We're going to talk about the new Murder Hornets documentary that's available now. First off, Ted, thank you so much for taking the time to be on the show. Yeah, happy to be here. Now, now, Ted, tell us a, a little bit about uh, the, the the new documentary, your involvement in it, and uh, how, how creeped out are you by the murder hornets, and and are they even worse than some people are are giving them credit for? Yeah, you know the thing is, I mean, this this problem is is real. It, this is a huge threat for America and for our food supply, and so you know this this whole thing it seems kind of like a work of fiction or something that's just make believe. But the reality is, uh, at the current moment, the murder hornet is in the Pacific Northwest, and what they do is they fly around and search for honeybee colonies to, to decimate. And so they'll find a, a honeybee colony, and then they'll, they'll go in and they'll behead the bees. They literally bite the heads off of the bees, and they'll slaughter an entire bee colony in just a matter of hours. And of course, any threat to the honeybees is a threat to our 
our food supply because the agricultural industry depends on the honeybees. And, and for you, what what do you see firsthand from the from the murder hornets, and and, and how how does that does that affect uh, aside from like you said the, uh, the the agriculture and things like that? What human interaction uh, concerns are there? Yeah, well, you know, I guess primarily the threat of the murder hornet is what it can do to our food supply. And if uh, the, the bees get more wiped out, it's going to make food prices go up, and it's going to make the uh, the bigger problems for the food you know supply, but. A secondary, a secondary problem is the fact that if it stings a, a person, it, it can become life-breaking very quickly because a person can sustain a couple hundred honeybee stings, but you can only receive like a dozen stings or so from the murder hornet before it becomes life-threatening. So, I mean, we, we don't want them uh, on our soil because they will kill people. I mean, in Asia, a, a, at least a few dozen people die every year because of murder hornet stings. Now, for you as as a beekeeper, I mean, obviously this is going to affect your bottom line too. And how how are you combating the murder hornets on your own? Well, we are currently trapping for them, and uh, the idea is if we can, if we happen to trap one and it dies, well, we know to set up more live traps. Where if we can catch a live one, uh, then we try to track it back to its nest because it's, it's not good enough just to kill murder hornet foragers that we capture that are flying around. We have to find the nest and kill that queen and, and eradicate the nest if we're going to win this, this uh, war against the murder hornet. And so that's, that's the, the effort that we're doing right now, and that's kind of what's depicted in the, the documentary Attack of the Murder Hornet. It's going to show like a lot of the struggles that we're having of trying to track this thing back to the nest, because no one's really done this thing. We've never had this type of a problem on U.S. soil before, so really we're, we're flying it as we're building it, basically. Now, for you, do you, as you're out uh, hunting, tracking, and things like that, do you do you sometimes feel a little bit like John Goodman in arachnophobia? <laughs> all the time. You know, a lot of times, you know, as I'm driving along and I see all these dense woods, and I'm looking, I'm like, hmm, I wonder where the, where the murder hornet dent is up here. You know, it's, it's pretty creepy. Now, f- for you, how is how has the overall effect of the murder hornet affected your business and uh, and moving forward as well? Well, you know, it's pretty devastating. You know, I, I had an entire colony that was slaughtered by the murder hornets. So, you know, I showed up and literally 60,000 honeybees had been decapitated. You know, those murder hornets, they show up, they're very efficient, they slaughter an entire colony uh, in a matter of, of an hour or two, and uh, and that's it. They, they rip out the, the baby honeybee larva and steal that and, and take off. You know, it's a terrible, terrible thing. And so, you know, the, the more nests and the more murder hornet nests that we have in the United States, that's going to create more of that decimation of the honeybee population. And so, you know, it, it, it's real uh, you know, it, It's real frustrating uh, to, to, to know that there's something that's terrible in the woods that's, that's seeking out honeybees to destroy. And not only that, but it's a threat to anyone. If someone happens to be tromping through the woods and they get too close to a murder hornet nest, you know, that's going to be... That's going to be very, very dangerous for that poor person. And, Ted, what do you think is the biggest misconception that folks have about, about the murder hornets? Well, a lot of people aren't too concerned about it because they don't see it in their backyard yet. They're like, oh, yeah, there's some murder hornets up there in the Pacific Northwest. Oh, big deal. But the reality is, I guarantee you, it's going to, you know, if, if we're not successful, it's going to push down into Oregon and California, and then it's going to head east and go into Texas and Oklahoma. I mean, it's going to it's gonna push, it, it stops to spread, and it's going to try its best to spread across the United States. And so at the current moment, people aren't too worried about it. It's kind of like COVID-19 at the very beginning, uh, whenever it was only in Wuhan. It's like, oh, they have, like, some new virus uh, over there in China. Oh, okay, well, you know, big deal. But, you know, once, once it spreads, then everyone's like, oh, crud, why didn't we do something about this before? Now, Ted, for for you as uh, as a beekeeper, a lot of folks they just think about honey being produced. What? How far have you guys delved out in the uh, uh, in the accessories, if you will, and and other ways to use the use the honey? Yeah, well, we uh, we I mean, uh, honey. Uh, so you know, we we basically sell honey. That's our biggest uh, money maker for for McFall Bee Yard. But we also uh, offer pollination services. So when someone uh, is is growing a uh, blueberries or going growing raspberries or has an apple tree orchard or, or needs it for nuts or something like that. You know, the, the farmers pay us to, to put our bee colonies on their land because, you know, without those honeybees, you know, they're not going to get a crop of uh, whatever they're trying to grow. So, I mean, that puts money in our pocket, too. We, uh, and we, uh, we also uh, we occasionally sell uh, pollen, occasionally propolis. I mean, there's, there's different ways of uh, making a living in a beekeeper. 
That's right. And and Ted, I, I, I love having the opportunity to talk to you because I, everybody else I've been asking, what was the most COVID purchase they made in 2020? My question for you, what is the most Murder Hornet purchase that you made in 2020? <laughs> the most mur- Murder Hornet purchase? Yeah. Uh, well, I, I guess probably all these traps, you know. Uh, you know, every week, I, you know, I go out and I uh, rebait all these uh, murder hornet traps. You know, I was experimenting using different types of pheromones and using cat food because they, they also like, uh, you know, meat and stinky meat, particularly like fish and stuff like that. And trying to use uh, orange juice. So, yeah, I was just trying to uh, all, all these different, all these different uh, uh, murder hornet baits. Uh, it, it actually, it started getting pretty pricey. <laughs> Well, Ted, uh, again, of the, uh, the the new documentary, Attack of the Murder Hornets, you can check that out. And, Ted, I want to make sure and let everybody know where they can keep up with everything you've got going on social media-wise as well. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, people can look us up at uh, McFall B Yard. Uh, we have a Facebook page. We have a website, Uh Yeah, they can, uh, we, we try to keep uh, folks updated. And, uh, yeah, I'm sure anyone that likes the that, that likes, uh to follow something creepy, uh, you know, the whole murder hornet story is very creepy and it's very true. It's very real. The, everything in the in the documentary is authentic and, uh, and factual. So, you know, it's, it's hard to believe, but it's real. There you go. Well, Ted, it's been great to visit with you this morning. I hope you have a great weekend and uh, hopefully we'll catch up again real soon. Awesome. Thank you. Thanks again to our good friends at Smiley's Breezy Vapes. Check them out online at Facebook. Or just stop in and see them at 313 Falcon Road in Altus. They've got red basket specials always changing those up. And if you ever have a question, maybe need some new hardware, and you don't have time to stop in, call or text at 580-471-VAPE. That's 580-471-8273. Well, if your eating schedule has been out of whack due to the pandemic and working from home, here are some tips from registered dietitians. Your first meal of the day should be within 30 to 60 minutes of waking up, and when your stomach gets half full, digestion should take about four hours. So you shouldn't feel like you need a snack for a while. Now, if you're getting hungry an hour or two after breakfast, it's a sign that your meal was either way too small or it didn't have a balanced ratio of food groups like protein and fiber. Also, when you feel hungry, try thinking about it in terms of a hunger scale, where 1 is extremely hungry and 10 is stuffed. You need to aim to eat where you're about a 4 and stop at about 6. Now, based on all that, you should be ready for lunch at about 4 or 5 hours after breakfast. So, if you wake up at 8 and eat breakfast at 8.30, your ideal lunchtime is probably somewhere around 1 p.m. But still, everybody is different. And a lot of factors go into it, like your age, your appetite, and how much you move around during the day. Well, our final guest is singer and songwriter Jen Bostic. We'll talk about the single Jealous of Angels, which has gone number one in the UK. First off, Jen, I, I want to say thank you so much for taking the time. Excited to talk about uh, about the single and, and so much more as well. Thank you so much for having me. Now, now, Jen, uh, first off, uh, I want to get a little background. Uh, I know you're from Minnesota, went to uh, went, went to college for music. And uh, tell us a little bit about the backstory where, where music first came into your life, if you will. Yeah, I grew up in small town, Minnesota, a little town called Waconia. And music was just always a part of our household. My parents loved the arts. They were always taking us to musicals. My dad loved playing piano and guitar. And I have many fond memories of us just standing around the piano singing as he played. And so it's always just been a huge part of my life. And unfortunately, when I was 10 years old, I was in a really bad car accident that took my father's life. And songwriting, it really just became the therapy for me that got me through. And the first time I sat down at a piano after losing my dad and just kind of started to play, I felt this presence. I felt like he was almost sitting next to me. And so I just hungered for that feeling over and over again. So I chased music all the way to Berklee College of Music where I went to college and studied music education. And then I moved to Nashville right after school and everything in me said, if you don't record an album and, you know, try to go on tour, you're going to regret it. And so that's what I've been doing for the last 12 or so years. And, 
yeah, it's just, it's been a journey. It's, you know, my definition of success always is ever changing, but I am so thankful to get to play music. What, what has Nashville taught you about yourself? You know, I think when I came here, I can't say, you know, it's the same for everybody. But when I came here, I was, I just wanted to be like the next Carrie Underwood. You know, I just, I wanted to be this, this country star and do all these big things. And I think that's like a really great, you know, dream, but I also kind of, I needed to find myself and who I was and what my authentic voice was. And I think those first few years in Nashville, realizing that Nashville is a town of paying your dues and people can see straight through when you're writing or recording music that isn't 100% authentic to who you are and what you do and what you're most gifted at. And so it took me, you know, an album and a half (laughs) to figure out, you know, who I was as an artist. And I'm continuing to, you know, figure that out. Of course, I think music just constantly is evolving. And so I put out a record in 2012 that kind of gained some success for me and doors started to open. I got to play the Grand Ole Opry in the Ryman Auditorium and it was just an incredible gift and I've gotten to tour internationally and the song that is the single that we've talked about is a song called Jealous of the Angels that I wrote for my dad actually a few years back with two good friends, Jimmy Fortune and Zach Runquist. And uh-huh. yeah, I originally released the song back in 2011. And I, I went on tour, the song went number one in England. I had just so many beautiful things happen that I, are so much bigger than anything I could really take credit for. And I've just seen so much life with this song and I've heard so many stories. There was something in the song that just when I was vulnerable, it gave other people the permission to be vulnerable and share their stories with me. And so I was getting just thousands of messages. Other artists went on to cover the song and had a lot of success with it. And just a few weeks ago, last week, I guess, was uh, the anniversary, the 25th anniversary of my dad's passing. And so I have had a chance to go back in the studio and I released this new version of it, which includes a verse of Amazing Grace, which I have been, playing live for years and so i i just really had a chance to go back into the studio and bring those stories bring that experience of playing the song live and just knowing now the power it can have when i you know first recorded it i had no idea what it was it was just a personal song that i was going to share so it's been a really incredible journey that i'm grateful to be on you you mentioned writing with jimmy fortune i mean how nervous were you the first time you you stepped in a room to write with Jimmy? I mean, he's he's an amazing person. I, I'm sure he probably was calming you as as soon as he came in, right? Yes, he's a legend. Uh, you know, I knew the the heart behind that writing session was kind of focused on my experience with my dad. And Zach had had the idea of Around the Throne tonight. And he had kind of presented it to me and said, I think Jimmy's the perfect person. And this was my first time ever writing with Jimmy. <laughs> and I think I was so focused on the fact that I was showing up to this writing session at Jimmy's house completely <laughs> unprepared. Like I felt like I hadn't, you know, really had a chance to come up with great lyrics or melody. And so I'm on my way to Jimmy's house. It's pouring down rain and I'm having all these feelings of just guilt (laughs) that I don't have great ideas. And so I pull into this parking lot and I pull out my journal and I just start writing. I was like, I have to get myself in that space. And so I wrote probably about six pages front and back. And then I, you know, went in, went on the road, got to Jimmy's house. And I said, you guys, I'm so sorry. I'm totally unprepared, but like, at least I sat down and like, I wrote these journal pages. I'm just going to read them to you. And within those pages was the phrase, I'm just jealous of the angels that are with my dad now. And Jimmy just turned to me and he said, that's our song. And it literally fell out in about 45 minutes. We were all crying. Like it was just like a really special writing session. And you're right. Jimmy Fortune is a just such an incredible human being and he has this presence that you're just with him for you know a minute and you just feel peace and calm and just you feel accepted and loved and it's it's a very unique thing yeah it's it's funny whenever you meet folks like that that you've idolized and and you've tried to imitate on uh, on cds and well tapes i did i, I did <laughs> yes their brothers but uh, to, to meet them and them exceed your expectations and and that's that's not so much the um, 
the odd thing in Nashville. That's kind of the norm. And and, and how has the camaraderie in Nashville and the the family environment, especially among country music artists, songwriters, how has that affected you as well? You know, I've been really, really blessed. I've met some incredible people, a lot of which I've stayed friends with, you know, my entire 12, 13 years here. And I am very involved in singing at my church as well. So, and that's been great to create community that way. But I feel like it's just such an encouraging place. I have also written in and recorded in London and Los Angeles and New York. And they're great cities, but there's something just so family based here in Nashville that I, I just love and I can't find anywhere else. So I'm thankful for that. I feel like I have a great group of girlfriends who are all artists and we just constantly encourage each other and build each other up. And that's, you need that as an artist, you know, like you need that, that support. Cause there's so many days when it's super easy to doubt what we're doing. <laughs> <laughs> now who is, who's had the biggest impact on you? Maybe they're in Nashville, maybe another songwriter or somebody that, it's kind of taking you under their wing or maybe just given that advice that you needed to hear, even though you didn't want to hear it. Yeah, that's a great question. There are many, many people. Uh, there was a man who unfortunately passed away at the end of 2019. His name is Jay Frank. And back when it was a song that I wrote called Kiss My Rainy Day Away, and I entered into a songwriting competition and he was one of the judges for the following session. So my song ended up in his email box and I get a phone call. Mind you, I have nothing going on really in my, I've, I've recorded an album and I don't really know what I'm doing. And he was working at CMT at the time. And he called me out of the blue and he said, Hey, I heard your song, you know, and I, I really love it. And I want to hear what else you have. And anyway, long story short, he ended up becoming my publisher for years. And he really just championed me in the way that, you know, I, it, it opened so many doors and he just encouraged me. He believed in me when I wasn't, you know, quite able to believe in myself. Even he connected me with so many people. So I would say he is definitely a huge, had a huge impact on my life. And also Lauren Christie, who is the head of my record label right now. She's an unbelievable hit songwriter, Grammy nominated producer. And she's written so many songs that people know, you know, the Avril Lavigne Complicated and Skater Boy and just so many artists. So she has just been such a gift. We've created, you know, this sisterhood together. And I'm so thankful that she believes in the music that we've written together for this latest project. And it's just, it's such a, a gift to get to work with her. Now, you talk about the sisterhood. How has that changed in in Nashville? I mean, I, I remember whenever I first came into country radio about 10 years ago, it was like you had to kind of I was instructed to kind of watch how many women you played in, based in your hour. But I, I see things changing on the radio side. Do you see it there in Nashville as well? The opportunities are are there more of them? You know, that's interesting. I was on the road for so long before before 2020. Um, <laughs> and I was kind of in and out of town. Maybe I was in town half as much as I was out of town on tour. But when I did show up to writer's rounds and things like that, I mean, maybe the increased female artists, maybe it's happened a little bit, but I see so many bills of, you know, even just just women, which is incredible. And I, anytime I'm in a writer's round, there's at least, you know, one other woman in the writer's round. So I'm, I think it's, it's really incredible that women are able to support each other here. I think that that, you know, it's kind of a stereotype of like girls get jealous of one another and you know, all of those things. But I think there cat is fight, a really, right? you sorry. The cat fights, right? Yes. Cat fights. No, but I haven't <laughs> experienced much of that here. And you know, maybe I'm just lucky. Maybe it is here and I'm just not seeing it. But I, I truly think that, you know, if one of us rises, like we all rise together, you know, so it's, I think other people realize that as well. And we're all just out here trying to be bold and make art and touch people's lives. Now, I know that you mentioned singing in church growing up, and, and obviously your faith is is huge, and it, and it plays out in the song as well. And for, for your faith to be out there on the spotlight and also for others to draw inspiration from the song in your writing, I mean, mm -hmm. what does that mean to you personally? Not, not professionally, but on a personal level. You know, I am so thankful for the gifts that I've been given, and I know that I 
wouldn't have any of them if God hadn't given them to me. And so for me to be able to honor him through the music that I'm creating is, you know, the greatest gift. And I'm so thankful that I get to do that. And when I think about my catalog of music and the songs, you know, there are some fun love songs that like maybe someone would hear a thread of faith in and maybe they wouldn't. Um, and those are always fun to sing, but I think my heart just feels the most fulfilled when I'm authentic and honest about all parts of me. And my faith is such a huge part of that, that if you're not hearing that through my music, I don't think you're fully hearing me. <laughs> Listen up. <laughs> I guess. <laughs> now we've talked about the song and, and, and I, I love seeing somebody, I don't get very many that have the keyboard in front of them. It's usually a guitar. So I, I think you will be the second that we've had that actually okay. is, is on the keyboard. And I'm going to let you kind of do a little intro and, and, and tell us about the, the, the song you're going to play. Yes. So as I mentioned, uh, the song is about my dad who passed away when I was young and it is everything I needed to say. I had written many songs prior to this song that I tried, I attempted to get all those feelings out. But when this one was written, there was a weight that just lifted off my shoulders. I never planned on performing this song live. It was something that in the moment of the show, in the writer's round, all of a sudden my heart was racing, my palms were sweating, and I just knew I was supposed to play this song. A woman came up to me after the show that night. She said, I lost my dad two days ago, and I know you played that song for me tonight. Wow. And that was the start of this unbelievable journey. Um, like I said, it ended up on the radio in Europe, and it brought me to the stage of the Grand Ole Opry, but the just the most special thing about it all has been connecting to people in a way I never realized my music would allow me to do. And so I'm grateful for that. Again, it's bigger than me. I feel like God <laughs> put this one in our laps, but this song is called Jealous of the Angels. I didn't know today would be our last That I'd have to say goodbye to you so fast I'm so numb, I can't feel anymore Praying you just walk back through that door And tell me that I only dreaming You're not really gone as long as I believe There will be another angel around the throne tonight Your love lives on inside of me and I will hold on tight It's not my place to question God knows why I'm just jealous of the angels Around the throne tonight You always made my troubles feel so small You were always there to catch me Heroes come and go Well, God just took the only one I know So I'll hold you as close as I can Longing for the day When I see your face again But until Just jealous of the angels around the throne tonight, singing hallelujah, hallelujah, hallelujah. I'm 
just jealous of the angels around the throne tonight. So now you join with John Barry as the second person to bring tears out of my eyes in an interview. Aww. So there you go. There you Aww, go. Oh, <laughs> thank you. It's encouraging. Now, now we, we talked earlier about uh, whenever you came in and you thought you had your voice, you had to learn what your true voice was. How hard were the growing pains? You know, I think trying to uh, just almost unlearn that idea of I want to write songs that are gonna be on the radio and this is what I'm, what's on the radio so this is the song I have to write kind of unlearning that is that was a challenge for sure and I think it's great to kind of look at what songs are hits and almost you know look at the melodies and why are they you know maybe so successful but every once in a while a song will just hit you and slay you in the heart and those are the songs I really want to write you know I think that's I think a lot of songwriters can agree with that and so I think when I had to just kind of stop and stop thinking about what else I'm hearing and just write about the truth that lies within me. And I think that when we're not authentic, you know, like we rob the world of something a little bit. Like if you, cause there's something unique that each person has that if we're not gonna put it in the world, it's never gonna get out there. So that to me, it, it helped me to kind of realize that I have a lane, I have a, you know, a specific unique purpose and I just need to worry about that lane and <laughs> I don't need to do all these other things, which is sometimes difficult because as a vocalist, I love singing so many different styles and there are moments for that in my life. And in some of the shows that I do, I can kind of spread my wings. But when it comes to what songs am I going to invest in recording? You know, I want to make sure that those are my best songs that best represent me and my voice and my heart. Now, what uh, what was the biggest thing you pulled from 2020 as you go setting goals for 2021 and beyond? It's a great question. Uh, I think realizing how much we can connect with one another through technology has been really beautiful and trying to you know, step outside of our comfort zones and figure out what it means to be a sound engineer and a lighting technician and all of these things from home and the struggle, the growing pains, the frustrations that came with that those first few months were tough. Um, I was actually in the middle of a European tour when the borders started to close. <laughs> so that was scary. <laughs> uh, but I, I love to travel and I love to tour and I won't take that for granted again, I don't think. You know, I think that it's taught us to be grateful for what we do have. I've enjoyed I'm time home with my husband. I've been married for almost 10 years now, so I don't think I've been home as much as I was in 2020 during our entire marriage. So, you know, just prioritizing your life and what matters the most, I think is something that we're all kind of experiencing. In. And then just the life edit that has been 2020, you know, trying to, okay, if I'm going to be home, what can I, what can I organize and figure out what's working? What's not, you know, we've all had a time to just reflect on life. So there's many things that I'll carry into the future, but you know, there's as much as we would have liked it to go differently. I think there has been a few silver linings. Now, you, you talked about touring in Europe and what's the music scene like, especially country music wise in Europe and, and, and elsewhere in the world as you travel? I mean, how much different do the country music fans look like elsewhere? You know, the United Kingdom is where I've done most of my touring overseas and the love and the hunger for real 
country songs and just fun, you know, country. There's so many country festivals over there. There's, it's, it blows my mind. And yes, they're, you know, a smaller country, obviously. So maybe it's, things are more accessible. Like everything's, you know, a couple hour train ride if you want to be at something. But I have just received so much support over there and i'm so so thankful switzerland surprised me with their love for country music at least you know the the type of country music that you put me in i know that we have many sub genres in country but the singer songwriter country kind of worked really well for me in switzerland germany as well they are so much fun and, <laughs> and are always always looking you know to either cry from a song or party from a song i feel like <laughs> so yeah i've had some great experiences now, how much different is when you're out on the road, does does your songwriting change based on the location? I mean, whenever you're traveling Europe, does do you see different uh, inspiration on your writing as well? Yes. I think just experiencing the world inspires music, obviously. And when the more I get to see, I feel like, and the more I get to experience and the more people I get to talk to, the more I have to draw from. And so while it may not be you know, geographical specific, it, it might just inspire things in a different way because I've seen more once I finally get back to Nashville. Cause I don't do a whole lot of writing in, uh, when I'm out on the road. If I, I kind of keep my touring hat on for that experience, unless there's, you know, a co-writer I really want to work with while I'm in London or something like that. But I try to stay focused and compartmentalize which season <laughs> it is for me. Now, now, who who as a writer inspires you? Lauren Christie. <laughs> I know we already <laughs> talked about her, but she is just unbelievable. And, you know, I loved her songs before I got a chance to work with her. And then working with her and just seeing the way I've learned so much in the last, uh, man, we've been working together for now six or seven years. And just seeing the way melodies just come out of her and you know the way she can hear the production before you know the song's even written and it's it's amazing to me so i think somebody like that that just you know there's constant flow happening jeff cohen is another songwriting friend of mine that we write together a lot and his style is so different from lauren's but also so incredible and he's been a huge champion of mine as well so i'm super thankful for him, but Alan Shamblin, Mike Reed, I mean, Can't Make You Love Me is my favorite song ever. So those two are <laughs> definitely high on the list, but there's a, there's a lot of incredible songwriters out there as far as up and coming. I mean, not so up and coming anymore, but Emily Shackleton and Michael Logan are probably two of my absolute favorites. We're playing together in a couple of weeks here in Nashville and they're just, they inspire me so much. Now, now for you, do you subscribe to the to the process where you sit down and write every day, or does it just depend on where you're at? Like you said, uh, in, in what lane you're in? Yeah, that depends. I try to write a couple times a week for you know a four hour block of time or something like that. But I I struggle sometimes if if I don't structure my days as a creative day versus an admin day versus you know a, a day that I just need to be focused on performing, whatever those might be. But sometimes you don't have that luxury. Sometimes an opportunity comes up and you have to cram everything on the same day and you just do it, you know? So if I had my choice, you know, I would I would separate them, but. <laughs> now, now, what is your go-to if you're having writer's block? You know, I usually will just start playing the piano. Mm. If, I, if I can't, because it, that's where I feel like lyrics will start to tie me up um, because my songs aren't, super complex in, uh, musically. And so if I land on, you know, a chord structure that I like and have a certain melody that will usually inspire a lyric. But contrary to that, if I'm starting a song and I like know that, you know, I'm writing that day, I will most times start with a lyric or a song idea, you know, a theme. But if I'm stuck, I'll just start playing and then something will eventually pop out or you sometimes you just have to you know hang your hat up that day and say today was not the day you can try to write through it but some days it's just not happening now now if you go somewhere you're having a bad day they don't have a keyboard I, i'm a hack pianist myself so it, struggling having a rough day sit down at the keyboard it soothes and and helps put the day behind you if you go somewhere and you don't have a keyboard to what what is going to be your soothing relief well, I do play guitar, but if that's not available, <laughs> um, you know, I love tapping into music that 
inspires me or kind of I love worship music so if I put on like an all sons and daughters record or something like that that will soothe my soul and just kind of put me in a place of this is the importance of music you know it reminds me this is why I create music this is why I listen to music this is why I love music you know so just being reminded of that some I journal like there's no tomorrow I go through so many notebooks in a year so journaling you know it's taking a walk. I'm a runner. So going for a run, all those things are, you know, helpful for me. Uh, if I'm running, all you got to do is be faster than me. <laughs> that's, that's only, if you see me running, just, just be faster than me. That's all you got to do. <laughs> now, now, Jen, if, if folks want to find out uh, more information, upcoming tour dates, as uh, we all pray, those are coming as well. Uh, the music, social media, all that, where's, where's the best place to catch up with you? Yes, uh, my website, jenbostic.com, which is J-E-N-N-B-O-S-T-I-C.com. And I'm on all of the social media things, the Instagram, Facebook, Twitter. And then, of course, the music's all available on Spotify and iTunes and all the fun places. But I'm I'm new to TikTok. I'm trying. I am trying so hard, but I am in my 30s and, <laughs> you know. I, I understand completely. I'm not in my 30s and my daughter's like, Dad, with the podcast, you got to get on TikTok. I was like, I have no idea what I'm going to post. You're doing better than I am. Oh, thanks. You're kind. <laughs> well, Jen, thank you so much for your time today. It is, it's is—it's been great to visit. Love the song and uh, continued success to you. Hopefully, we'll catch up again real soon. Yes, thank you so much. It was great to meet you. Well, thanks again for joining me for this 31st episode of Good Questions with Cameron Dole here in Season 2. If you ever have a comment, a question, or anything else you'd like to know, you can find me on Instagram, Twitter, and Facebook, all at GQ with Cam. If you'd like to help out in the funding for this podcast, feel free to click the support tab and follow the instructions. And if you have a special guest idea, just email me, gqwithcam at gmail.com. Again, a reminder, check out the link that is in the episode title, in the article, I should say. We've got the link to our T Public page. Got lots of merch for you. Got shirts, magnets, stickers, you name it. Uh, you might find it there. Click on that link and follow it. Going to have some grand opening specials going on this weekend. Again, thanks to our good friend Brandon Allen, who came up with the theme song for Good Questions. Let him play us out. Hope you guys have a great weekend and join me back here Monday for episode 32.